The dodo used to walk around and take the sun and air. The sun yet warms his native ground. The dodo isn't there. The voice which used to squawk and squeak is now forever dumb. Yet you may see his bones and beak at the museum. Deep in the bowels of Oxford's Museum of Natural History is a treasure not as easy to see as when Hilaire Belloc wrote that verse or when Lewis Carroll and others were inspired by it. Um, this is the cupboard we keep the dodo in. Uh, very exciting this moment. The Oxford dodo is so precious it's kept safely hidden, constantly moved from safe place to safe place to deter thieves. And these rather unassuming grey boxes on this shelf down here hold those magical remains. So I'm just going to take these out of the cupboard. It's a rare and chastening privilege to be allowed to see this ultimate emblem of the inevitable. Take them up through to the lab so we can have a look at them. Zoe Simmons of the museum's life collections. Okay, so in the smaller box here, we have the articulated remains of the foot and some of the skin that would have been on that specimen. And in the larger box, which is a little more exciting for most people, is the head of the dodo. So you can see on the piece in front of us you have the dodo skull with half of the skin that's been sectioned and the piece that's been removed is lying just above it. So you can see both sides. It's actually an incredibly moving thing to see. Slightly unsettlingly as well you can see its eye which actually does have an expression. How rare are these remains then? For soft tissue, these are the only remaining pieces of soft tissue for the dodo in the world. So, incredibly rare, I guess, they're one of a kind. The dodo is evolution's fall guy, Didus ineptus, Linnaeus called it, dumbass bird, the Dutch settlers dubbed it. Take one harmless, flightless bird, let it evolve peacefully for millennia on its island, introduce some hungry sailors, and the result seems inevitable. But if the dodo is the icon of extinction, there may be hope that extinction itself could become extinct. It's a very new concept, the idea of de-extinction. It's a very controversial concept. It's hard to actually use that word. Can something be de-extincted? It's horrible. Paul Jepson teaches biodiversity at Oxford University. He explained the astonishing possibilities of de-extinction. So one idea is using technologies of genetic modification we can take DNA from specimens. This could be from specimens in museums. That's a little bit hard, they're often contaminated. Or it could be from specimens which are found, and a lot of the excitement is the DNA which is being extracted from mammoths in, in permafrost. And then we can splice that DNA into the DNA of living animals, such as the elephant. And from that, we can create an elephant with characteristic traits of mammoth. Another science of de-extinction, and this one is actually happening now and it's happening in Europe, is where species have been domesticated but we've lost their wild ancestor. So a fantastic example of that is the auroch, you know, the bull, very deep in, in European culture. This went extinct in the wild in 1627, but of course the DNA never went extinct because we domesticated the auroch and now we have cattle. So these ideas that actually if we've domesticated it, and transformed it in one way, we can transform it backwards. We can use DNA tests, basically, to look at how the back breeding is going and accelerate that so we get to something close to what the auroch was like. Majestic as it would be to have herds of woolly mammoths traipsing along the plains, what would we actually gain from that, or by having dodos waddling around again at our feet? Good question. I think there's a number of purposes for doing it. One is that it really pushes science, and from those scientific advances, other things will fall out of it. I think the other thing, though, is for me about changing the narrative back to, uh, to a narrative of vision and hope. There's perhaps a sense of guilt there as well, isn't it, that you know, this is the age of sixth extinction, apparently, and that perhaps somehow we're redeeming ourselves by bringing back some of the things that we... Destroyed. I agree, but, but then it comes to the question of why do we have to live in a world of guilt? We can say, yeah, we messed up, but actually, let's sort it out. You know? Let's kick on, Let, let's have this more positive future. I mean, what's philosophically as well as scientifically interesting to me about this idea of de-extinction is that it can go two ways, can't it? On the one hand, we are replenishing the world, 
bringing yeah. back the things that we got rid of. But on the other hand, we are perhaps investing in a sense that everything is reversible, therefore we might as well just go on consuming everything, burning everything, eating everything and killing everything. Yeah. Absolutely right. If we create the idea that actually extinction is reversible, then that could be a great opening to all of the development interests who are saying, well, okay, we've got a, an economic crisis, let's invest in that now and we can sort out this problem later on. I think that risk has to be countered against the potential benefits of it. I mean, de-extinction, it, it's a Jurassic Park type story. It really engages, it connects with, with people. So I think the concept that extinction doesn't have to be inevitable is quite old. Where we're at now is actually that when something has become extinct, it's not necessarily inevitable that it has to remain so. Okay, well, Zoe, I mean, you're responsible for this beautiful and quite moving object, which is the dodo's head and foot. If we could get enough DNA out of it and you have the option to bring it back, to de-extinct it, would you do it? No, I don't think I would. Actually looking at the specimen and understanding the history of it and looking back over the last 300 plus years, we've come as a race ourselves, as species, we've come quite a long way. We've learned a lot. Science is evolving and actually that's quite positive for me as a lesson that we can take forward from this specimen and apply to the natural world around us now. And I think that's the hope, is that we can see we've changed and we've learnt so much and that we're still trying to learn. But as for having a dodo running around again, I don't think it's ever going to be possible, for one. But I think it gives a false hope to assume that we could do that and that it would be okay for us to do that. Would we be able to put it back in the wild? Would it have the same habitat? No, I don't think it would. So... Let's talk about things that are currently under threat and what we can do to save those rather than whether we could repopulate pet dodos around the world. <laughs> but, I mean, this is fascinating because we're standing here in front of what remains of a dodo and it's not really just a scientific or biological question. It's an ethical one, isn't it, and a moral one. If we could bring it back, what would that do to us? Would it make us start to think that we could bring everything back? and We'll stop understanding the finitude of things, won't we? I think so, and I think with humans, the real point about inevitability when we talk about extinction and de-extinction, what everybody actually is doing is thinking about themselves, or at least about humans. So that's where they would logically apply it. So if you're talking about de-extinction, does that mean that I might not actually have to die and I could continue somehow? That's where logically we would all go in our own minds as this concept that perhaps we would exist in perpetuity.